In 2011, a joint NATO military action assisted local rebels in the country of Libya in overthrowing and killing their dictator, Muammar al-Gaddafi. This has become one of the most debated American military actions of the decade, so I thought I'd dive down the rabbit hole of conflicted feelings for this man by biographing one of the most significant North African leaders of modern history. Here goes. Gaddafi was born in 1942 to a Bedouin family in Libya. His parents herded camels and goats. The Bedouin people are a nomadic culture that has existed for thousands of years throughout the desert regions of North Africa and the Middle East, and have significant populations in most of these countries. He would have been nine years old when Libya gained its independence from European occupiers in 1951. Gaddafi would watch closely in 1952 when, in the neighboring country of Egypt, a political revolution took place which would ultimately end British occupation of Egypt and depose the Egyptian monarchy in favor of a more nationalist and anti-imperialist government. Although he wouldn't become president of Egypt until 1956, one of the most important people of the 1952 revolution was a man named Gamal Abdel Nasser. This revolution sent a wave of nationalism across the Arab world. The feeling would last throughout 1956 when Egypt fought off an invasion by Israel, France, and Britain. This nationalism would greatly influence Gaddafi's political leanings. In his early life, despite the fact that poor, illiterate Bedouin families typically didn't pay for education, his father found the money to send Gaddafi to an Islamic school, where he slept at a mosque during the week and walked home 20 miles to visit his family on weekends. After finishing elementary school, his family moved to the town of Saba in south-central Libya, where he was the first of his family to attend secondary school. This continued until 1961, when he was thrown out of Saba by local authorities for participating in a violent Arab nationalist protest. In 1963, Gaddafi joined the Libyan military and began training in the Royal Military Academy in Benghazi, where he refused to learn English and was rude to the British officers because of his anti-imperialist leanings. With some friends, he founded and became the leader of the Free Officer Movement, a group named after the Egyptian group that instituted the coup of 1952 and started recruiting new members to it. After working his way through the Libyan military, he was assigned to go to Dorset, England for further training, which included a nine-month English language course. He reluctantly learned the language. More than that, he learned that he liked his own Libyan culture much more than the English. He complained about racism and defiantly walked around London wearing traditional Libyan clothing. When Gaddafi came back to Libya after 1966, he was fortunate to find that the popularity of Libyan King Idris and his government had taken a big drop. With the increase in oil wealth, the government had come to be seen as corrupt and even pro-Israel. King Idris himself had recently passed some very unpopular reforms that gave him more far-reaching power. With his revolutionary group ready, Gaddafi sat and waited for the perfect opportunity. That opportunity came in 1969. That summer, the 80-year-old Idris went traveling to Turkey and Greece for medical treatment. On September 1st, they launched Operation Jerusalem in which they occupied government offices, airports, radio stations, and other places in the cities of Benghazi, where government was based, and Tripoli. Other military units, when hearing about what was happening, came out in support of the coup. The civilians in urban areas cheered it on. They met almost no resistance. In a radio announcement, after the success of the bloodless regime change, Gaddafi announced that this was purely an internal Libyan matter, not a threat to any other outside nation. Foreign people and property within Libya would be under the official protection of the army, and all existing treaties and agreements with other states would remain in effect. The country would now be known as the Libyan Arab Republic, and would be a state that resisted occupation from all Western powers. The country would not adopt atheistic communism or imperialistic capitalism, but instead adapt a form of Islamic socialism. Because of the mild take on foreign policy, the new regime quickly gained recognition from other nations, including the United States, on September 6th. Crown Prince Hassan, seen here filmed by a potato, the nephew of Idris who was next in line to succeed him, was put under house arrest. He announced a few days after the coup that he was renouncing all claims to the throne and endorsed the new government. In 1961, a Libyan court sentenced him to three years in prison. After his prison stay, he actually lived out most of his remaining years in Libya out of the public eye. King Idris, who assured the RCC he would not attempt to reclaim his country in exchange for the safety of his family, took up residence in Egypt for the remainder of his life. The official government body after this was the 12-member Revolutionary Command Council, the RCC, of Gaddafi's Free Officers Movement. Of this, Colonel Gaddafi was named Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. 
The 27-year-old revolutionary officer from a poor Bedouin family had successfully used his time in the military to not only make a name for himself, but to take control of an entire country. Now, what would he do with it? Salam ba hazar gate, salam ba hazar gate, na waye.